morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Katie Earl. I coordinate our University Express program, <laughs> and I work for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. And we're here with Sue Stucklosa this morning. She will be our speaker. Thank you, Sue. Great, oh, great, just... great to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. I'll do a quick housekeeping thing before we jump into her presentation. We are recording and I'll try to post it on our website in the near future. Any questions or comments for Sue, go ahead and type those right in our chat box. It's located at the lower right hand side of your screen. If you click on that, you'll expand it, send your questions and comments right to me. Or if you're on a smartphone or tablet, you click your screen, that brings up your control panel. You'll see a circle with three dots and there you'll find your chat. So we hope you participate today. So we'll quickly thank our sponsors, which is my Department of Senior Services, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all their support. And Senior Services is here for you if you need anything. Questions, services, supports, whatever you're looking for, start with us. We're at 858-8526. So the star of our show today, Sue is a nurse practitioner with 13 years experience in pulmonary and critical care practice. In this practice, she manages and educates countless numbers of COPD patients. She currently teaches the next generation of nurse practitioners at Damon College. She is certified basic life support and advanced life support instructor. And for this fall at a nurse New York State Nurse Practitioner Conference. She was selected to lecture on sleep apnea. So if you were on with us, you heard about that and it just happened. And maybe next semester, we're hoping to get that scheduled. So Sue, thank you. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about um, living with COPD. I'm gonna start off with a little bit about what COPD is and, and the triggers and how it's diagnosed. But the main bulk of it is how to uh, take care of ourselves when we're living with COPD. So what is COPD? There's a couple, it's a broad category. It's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And under that are different types. There's chronic bronchitis. And that's where there's just a lot, you know, a lot of mucus forming and a lot of coughing. Emphysema, bronchiolectasis, which is kind of rare. And a combination, and most people fall into the combination of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Um, their COPD. So what happens in COPD? So on the one side, we have a picture of a normal um, air sac called an alveoli. So we have millions of those in our lungs and around those, let's see if I can, yeah. Around there is the blood vessels. So the air comes in, the oxygen comes in, it goes across these thin membranes into the ox into the bloodstream and the carbon dioxide goes the other way and then the air goes in and out through the airways so if you look at a copd um air sac what happens is first of all the airway itself becomes narrow and uh tight or obstructed it also has scarring in it and um so the airway looks different and because it's hard to blow air out of these little air sacs because of the narrow airway, these air sacs get really enlarged. And bigger is not better here because if they lose their elect, uh, elasticity. Um, you see the blood vessels are not nicely around these air sacs, so it loses the ability to do the gas exchange. So this is what's happening in these very, very small air sacs. Like I said, you have millions of them. Um, in your lungs and both your lungs and happening in the airways. And this is just kind of another picture. We have a healthy lung, um, the unhealthy COPD lung. Again, you have the narrowing and the um, airways and the scarring and the tightening. They become inflamed. Um, and then with the inflammation, we make mucus. I, I, kind of liken it to you have a blister and you, you know, you're irritating, irritating, irritating something, you get fluid into it. Same thing with the lungs. You irritate them and irritate them and irritate them with the inflammation and you get fluid in the form of mucus. So that gives you the chronic cough. The other thing that happens is that because all this air is trapped in the lungs, because the airways are tightened up, it's hard to blow air out. So with COPD, not too bad getting the air in, hard to blow the air out. So the lungs become bigger, and again, bigger, not better, because it loses the elasticity. So you're walking, you know, it's like like uh, going around with a half-filled balloon. 
that you always have this, this um, trapped air. So consequently, when you go to do something, you're taking, you know, and you need to take deep breaths when you're walking, you already have that balloon half filled and have, and that's what leads to the shortest of breath that you get when you have COPD. It's a mechanical problem with the lungs. So again, you have decreased airflow, um, secondary to that obstruction and inflammation and scarring. So the, the air doesn't move in and out of the lungs as, as uh, well. You get an inflammatory response. So what that means is that something is irritating in, in the lungs um, and you have all this inflammation. So you have the mucus is product, uh, produced more, the airways are inflamed so that they're further narrowed and then eventually you get scarring. Like if you injured yourself anyplace else, as, as the healing, you get the scarring. And then you also get that thickening and that little lining on those air sacs. So it makes it hard for the oxygen to move back and forth. You also get an immune response. And by that, I mean something like kind of like an asthma kind of picture where you get the wheezing and the tightening of the, of the um, airways. The other thing that happens with COPD is your defense mechanisms don't work. You have all these little little hairs called cilia in the lungs that help move the, the mucus and the bacteria out. Well, these don't work. And in, in severe cases, they're kind of, they don't, they're all paralyzed. So you don't have the defense mechanism that you would usually have against infections and foreign foreign things in the air. So what are your symptoms when you have COPD? The, the biggest one is shortness of breath. Um, and primarily when you're exerting yourself, you know, most people will say to me, I don't feel bad if I'm sitting, but if I go to do something, I'm short of breath. Um, and particularly, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, particularly if you're doing something with your arms, because you're using kind of the same muscles to breathe as to move your arms. You may have chronic cough. You may or may not have a lot of phlegm or sputum production. You may have wheezing, chest tightness, frequent res respiratory tract infections. And studies have shown that people with moderate to severe COPD generally have two to three lung infections a year or, or bron you know, acute bronchitis a year because again, that defense mechanism doesn't work as well. So what are some of the risk factors of COPD? Well, the biggest one that we all know is smoking um, and smoking anything, you know, um, so smoking tobacco, but smoking marijuana, vaping, your lungs are not, um, you know, contrary to what we all learned in school, they're just big balloons that blow the air in and out. They're very, very sensitive organs. They have a lot of um, uh, chemicals and, and uh, you probably heard a lot with COVID, the cytokines, things that will try to protect your lungs because outside of your skin, um, the lungs are the, the only major organ that is constantly in contact with the environment. So anything in the environment you breathe in or breathe, you know, breathe in can affect the lungs and cause um, these inflammatory responses. So smoking anything, industrial exposure, and in this area we have a lot of, you know, um, exposure from, you know, people working in the steel plants and the chemical plants, air pollution in general, um, and then. This is very rare, but there's a, um, a syndrome called alpha-1 amitriptyline deficiency that you don't make this enzyme. And it's, um, it's hereditary, it runs in families, and it causes early COPD. And that's easily checked with a blood test. So how do we diagnose COPD? COPD is diagnosed through breathing tests, pulmonary function tests, or spirometry. And uh, many of you, have probably had this test, you know, you're, you're breathing in, you're breathing out, it's kind of tiring. Um, but what we're looking for is how much air you can get into your lungs and how fast you can blow the air out. And you, this is a, a busy slide, but I just wanted to show you this because a lot of times you'll have these breathing studies and your doctor will say, oh, you have stage one COPD or you have, you know, stage three. And this is where they get it from. It's how the numbers from your pulmonary function tests. Um, so, if, and they go by what's called an FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second. How fast you can blow the air out. Because again, with obstruction, it's gonna take you a longer period of time to blow the air out. 
healthy lungs, you blow the air right out. Tight lungs, goes on forever. So depending on where you come out on this test is the severity of the COPD. So you have mild, moderate, severe, very severe, and it goes with stage one, stage two, stage three. The only thing I wanna say about this is that these are important things to know when you have COPD, but it isn't the whole picture. I've taken care of people with really, really bad breathing studies that are still working. Um, I've taken care of people that their breathing studies aren't as bad and they're short of breath when they walk to the bathroom. So it's, it's an important thing to know, but it's not telling the whole story about how you feel. So what does pulmonary function test tell us? It tells us if you do indeed have a obstructive lung disease or COPD. Um, it really is the only way to diagnose it. You don't diagnose it off of chest x-rays or anything like that. It's a, a, a pulmonary function test. It'll show us the severity of the COPD. Sometimes they'll have you do the test, then they'll have you take some, um, some inhaler called albuterol and do it again and see if, if the numbers are better. We look at trends over time. Um, when you have COPD, there's really not a cure for it, but we wanna hold the line. So if every year your numbers are the same, we're pretty happy. Um, sometimes we do them for a response to certain medication. We put you on different inhalers or things, and then we check it again, see if it's better. The other thing it can tell us is how well the lungs are exchanging those gases, the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, which are its, its jobs. So it's kind of what COPD is in a, in a nutshell and how we diagnose it. So now what do you do after you have a diagnosis of COPD? This is how can you manage your COPD? So there's you know, a few broad categories I'll talk about, smoking cessation, um, your inhaled medications, um, exercise, pulmonary rehab, uh, vaccines, and, and nutrition. So the most, really one of the most important things, if you have, C, well, and even if you don't have COPD, but especially if you have COPD and you're still smoking, try to quit, really try to quit smoking. This graph is busy, you don't have to know, but what it shows you, the blue lines on this graph are people who um, have never smoked. And we all have a little diminished lung function as we get older. Uh, the dotted line is people who quit smoking at 45 when they were, say, first diagnosed with mild COPD. And you see that how it kind of levels off and plateaus the, their lung function. The dark, the dark purple one is uh, they still smoked and they had COPD and you see that they, the lung function goes down um, in, in an arc, you don't, you go down quicker. So you will, and even people who quit smoking at 65 and had severe COPD, they did get a little bump in their lung function by quitting smoking. But the take home message with this graph is if you continue to smoke and you have COPD, it's really a pretty downward trajectory. Uh, for lung function as opposed to getting it plateaued. So as far as, you know, quitting smoking is hard. Um, you know, I quit smoking a long time ago, but it was a really one of the hardest things I ever did. Uh, the first thing I would suggest is reach out to your doctor. See what programs they're involved in. There are some medications out there. A lot of the, some of the medications have a lot of, um, um, you can't have them with, take them with certain comorbidities, but you know, so reach out to your doctor, say, I, I really, really wanna try to quit smoking. Uh, what should I do? Is there a medication or a program? New York State has a program called NY Quits. Um, you can get it online or a phone number. Um, I think they give still give you like a free month, month of patches, um, nicotine patches, and then a lot of support to help quit. In person, um, a few times a year, there's programs through the American Lung Association in Roswell Park. And I actually have sent a couple of patients to Roswell Park and they really thought that that program there was very helpful. But, you know, don't, uh, I, I would tell people, don't think you have to, you know, tough it out on your own. Um, you know, it's a hard thing to do and uh, it's wisdom to get whatever help you can get. So, Mainstay of treatment, medication treatment for um, COPD is inhaled medications. And there's um, many different ones. Um, 
And of course, your doctor or your provider, you know, will will order the appropriate ones for you. I want to concentrate a little bit more on how to take them and when to take them. And the first one is the albuterol inhalers. And these are, we, we always used to call them rescue inhalers. And I'm trying to change that to like a symptom control inhaler. Because people, you don't need to be ready to call the rescue squad to use this. It's for symptoms like shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, in between your maintenance inhalers. There's three different brands. They're all albuterol. They're all the same. They're just all, they're made by different companies. Pro Air, Ventolin, and Proventil. And then you also can get albuterol through a nebulizer if you have the nebulizer machine at home. This is used as needed for symptom control. And the general dosing is two puffs. You can't, not any more often than every four hours. You also can use this prior to any situations that produce symptoms. Like, you know, if you're going to carry those groceries out of your car, you're going to get really short of breath. Take a couple puffs, 15, 10, 15 minutes beforehand. Um, you know, the other thing is, is that, you know, some people think, well, they take if the symptoms aren't bad. I'll take one puff now and one puff later. It just doesn't work that way. You want to take the two the two puffs together um, to get the the open. This opens. This is a fast acting airway opener. It works within 15 minutes, but it only works for about four hours. So that's why it's a symptom um, controller. So, you know, this is a this is a pro air. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you about this, I don't even see this in the picture. If you want to know these do expire, so if you're not using them often, you need to keep track of when they expire. This pulls out, and on there is the expiration date, which this one is October 21, so this one needs to go in the garbage. Um, so it, it's not going to hurt you, but what it's going to be, it's just not going to be as effective as if it's already expired. This is a Z slide, but basically what I'm showing you is there's a whole bunch of different inhalers. You're going to see on television, there's tons of commercials about all these different inhalers. The, the downside is that we really only have three main types of inhalers outside of the albuterol. We have the inhaled steroids. We have a long acting airway opener. So like the albuterol works in 15 minutes but only works for four hours. The long acting airway openers don't work quickly, but they work for 12 or 24 hours. And then there's another type of airway opener that also uh, helps dry out the lungs. So those are the three main types of inhalers. When you see the commercials for the different ones, they're all those type of inhalers in different combinations. Um, so you, ha you, know, you have to be a little, careful because of these combinations, you don't want to be taking the same thing twice. But the albuterol is your relievers or your symptom control, and then the maintenance ones are the ones I just talked about. And if you try to use those when you can't breathe or you're in trouble, you're not going to, it's not going to help because, again, these aren't quick acting, they're long acting. They're the ones like if you take a pill for your blood pressure, um, you know, they work all day long till you take the next one. Um, the other, you know, the other thing is only taking them as needed is not um, a good strategy either. Um, because as we talked about how COPD works, there's always some inflammation and some narrowing that's always going on in, in your lungs. And most of these inhalers will settle that down. So, Again, using the example of, let's say, blood pressure medicine, you don't take your blood pressure medicine only on the days you feel bad. You take it every day. So the maintenance inhalers, you're going to take every day. And the albuterols, you're going to use as needed. And then there's a little thing about the flare-up uh, meds. Some, you know, flare-up, you may do need antibiotics and, and oral steroids. And we'll talk a little more about that. So how do you use an inhaler? So these pictures are for this type of inhaler. You take it off and you put that in your mouth. So you want to shake the inhaler. You want to breathe all the way out. You want to put the inhaler in your mouth and your lips around it so it doesn't blow out. Press down while you breathe in. And these say hold for 10 seconds. Sometimes 10 seconds is a hard time to long time to hold it. But 5 to 10 seconds, 
Hold it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then breathe out slowly. Then take your second puff in the same process. There's also these inhalers that are called powder inhalers. And those are the ones that look like this, where you just you open up the top and you breathe in through there. So the same thing here. You open the inhaler, breathe out, deep breath. You want to close your lips around that. Hold it for 10 seconds. Breathe out slowly and close the inhaler. Now with those, when you open that um, cover, you load one dose. You can't get more than one dose. You can breathe on it all you want. It's one dose. And then when you close it, it sets it up for the next dose. Also, if there's any, you know, the inhalers, um, you should, you know, rinse and gargle a little bit in the back of your throat. There's also spacers. Spacers are helpful um, because you don't have to time it so much. And this is a spacer. And what you would do with that, if you just hook this on to the back of it, and then you push, and the um, medicine stays in here until you breathe in. So you don't have to be so, you know, um, it doesn't have to be so timed. But you want to still shake your inhaler, put it into the spacer. You're going to breathe out all the way, press down, get the medicine in the spacer, breathe in, hold it for the count of 10. And obviously, going back to this one, it's just these type of inhalers that will fit in there. The powdered ones won't. You can get a spacer. Your um, if if you have that type of inhaler, you can get a spacer if you need one from a uh, script from your doctor and the pharmacies have them. So, what about exercise? You know, like, oh, exercise. I do this. I've grown too. So, we're going to talk about just some general things to do pulmonary rehab and then something to help with the shortness of breath called pursed lip breathing. So one of the things that I mentioned before is that um, what becomes kind of limiting in your life is the difficulty that people have when they um, have you know fairly severe COPD to do stuff with their arms. You know people say I can walk you know, I can walk the whole grocery store and the whole mall, but you put a, you know, laundry basket that I have to carry or some groceries I need to carry or taking a shower and washing my hair is very difficult. And again, if you think about it, as we use some of the muscles to move our arms, these are also some of the same muscles that we use to move our rib cage. So you're already using more of those muscles than healthy lungs would to get the air in and out of these air trapped lungs. And then you put the extra stress of using your arms. So the, the stronger you can keep your arms, the better it will be as far as those the kind, kind of quality of life issues of, you know, not being so short of breath when you take a shower. And they're easy things. I have the pictures here, just some weights. You can use one pound weights um, or three pounds or whatever, you know, but start small. Uh, some people use, uh, um, uh, cans of vegetables or whatever, and you're just moving them, you know, up to the side, up and down, just to keep those muscles strong in the arms, just sitting down, watching TV, uh, using the weights um, a couple times a day. Um, the other thing as far as just pure, you know, exercise, one of the best things to do when you have COPD is to walk. You don't have to do a lot of, you know, um, crazy stuff. But walking and keeping your arms strong um, are, are good uh, strategies. Now, purse lip breathing. So, what? So, any of you folks with COPD and have shortness of breath, you know how it is. You start to do something, you start to get short of breath. Your 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 mind tells you that you have to open up your mouth and you kind of start panting, right? Because you can't get the air in. Now, you know, and picture this half filled balloons of your lungs with COPD. Now you're panting and getting all more air in and not really getting that air out. And then you get more short of breath, you get more panicky because we're hardwired to be panicky when we can't breathe and it just gets into a vicious circle. If you can get into the purse lip breathing, practice it when you're not so short of breath, 
it can help control some of that. Because what you're doing is you're you're breathing in, but you're breathing out twice as long through like lips that are pursed, so through a little bit of resistance, and it will help get some of that um, uh, air out of your lungs. So you inhale slowly through your nose, and I was taught you do it for a count of three, and then you blow it out, make your lips like you're gonna whistle, and blow it out for the count of six. And it takes, you know, when you're short of breath and you're in that moment, it takes a lot of concentration to do that because you want to go like this instead of, but you will get control of your short, you know, control of the shortness of breath if you use that. Um, the other thing to talk about pulmonary rehab, um, very, very um, good program. Um, unfortunately, we only have one program in this area. It's at um, Mercy Ambulatory Center. Um, but um, anyone I've sent there has really thought it was beneficial. And I think there's three things that help with this. Number one is you do some controlled exercise because um, you're gonna be monitored and they're gonna watch your oxygen and you're gonna slowly um, gradually increase the things you can do on a treadmill or on a bike. Because again, it's scary to be short of breath. So if you go to do stuff and you're short of breath, it's scary and you don't know if you should continue or sit down. But the folks there, there's um, a respiratory therapist, nurse um, and a, um, a physical therapist, they'll be watching you. So you can with confidence realize what you can and can't do. Um, the other thing is, is they have a whole education program. So what I'm talking about, like say uh, the purse lip breathing and other strategies, that would be a whole talk that they would do. And the third, and I think very, very um, important is that you are with other people who have the same problem as you do. And um, you get a, you get a, a, a support group um, because people who don't, have never had trouble breathing, maybe don't understand what you're going through or don't understand how scary it is to be short of breath. So if you have that op opportunity, uh, the, uh, like I said, unfortunately, there's only one program um, in the area. If there's insurance issues, um, you know, we're kind of penny wise and pound foolish, I think sometimes. Um, there's also um, pulmonary rehab um, uh, videos and things online that you can start, you know, maybe doing a, uh, doing some things. So next, vaccines. Um, I think I can't stress the importance of vaccines um, in um, people and you guys with COPD. You already have um, issues with your lungs. Your defense mechanisms don't work as well. So when you get some of these respiratory illnesses, they can really be um, significant and, and fatal. So annual flu vaccine, um, very important. Um, generally, people don't die of the flu, they die of post-influenza pneumonia. And um, I, I have unfortunately see that every year in our patient population, um, because again, they're, you know, they're real susceptible. The other thing I would say about the flu, and you can check with your doctors is that you know, generally the feeling is, um, you know, you get the flu, you go to bed for a few days um, and it'll pass. And that's that's a fine feeling um, for people with um, healthy lungs or younger people. But people with uh, COPD, you know, they may want to treat you with some Tamiflu. Um, even though there's no cure for the flu, there is some studies that show things like Tamiflu can um, decrease the incidence of hospitalization and post-influenza pneumonia. So if you have the flu and you're feeling sick, I would just, you know, don't don't assume you're just gonna um, wait it out at home. Just run it, run it by your doctor or talk to them beforehand. COVID vaccine, um, obviously um, you guys um, are in one of the high risk groups uh, for bad outcomes with COVID. So, um, and I think that uh, you would all be um, eligible if you have COPD and or over 65 for the booster. 
pneumonia vaccines, um, you can check with your doc. There's um, different there's different strains, but basically um, we co it covers uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, which is the most common pneumonia people get outside of the hospital. Um, and the numbers for pneumococcal pneumonia, even with kids, because they get the same, they get a pneumonia vaccine, have, have just really plummeted with this vaccine. And um, so it depends which one you got, which strain, how old you are. So that's something to check with your doctor if you are due for a pneumonia vaccine. It's not something you get yearly. Um, it's a, um, you can, depending on, um, depending on, um, your other illnesses get a dose before 65, but you certainly get a dose after 65, and that's the one time dose. So, nutrition. So, um, one of the things with, um, with COPD is that um, as it progresses and you start to sp expend so much of your energy breathing, you use up more calories. And if you don't take in enough calories, in particular protein, um, you start to have muscle wasting. And one of the largest muscles in the body is the diaphragm, which moves the lungs up and down. So you start to have weight loss and muscle loss. You also will have muscle loss in the diaphragm and it'll actually make it harder to breathe. So. What you want to do is you want to maintain a normal normal weight. You don't want to be too thin and muscle wasting. You don't want to be too heavy either, because then obviously that's more work on the muscles and the lungs. You want to make sure you're getting enough protein to maintain your muscle mass. It will help with the breathing and also for your, you know, your arm strength and your leg strength. You want to stay well hydrated. Um, especially if you're a person with COPD that makes a lot of mucus. Because if you get dehydrated, um, especially now, let's say, as the furnaces are going on, everything's kind of getting dry, and that mucus gets thicker, you know it's harder to get out. So you want to be um, maintain good hydration so that mucus uh, stays thin. And sometimes it's hard to eat, and that's how we start to, you know, people start to lose um, weight and muscle mass. Because every time they eat, they're short of breath. Because, again, there's your stomach right below your diaphragm. You fill up your stomach and you can't take as deep breaths. So, so it may be more comfortable if you're in that situation to eat smaller, more frequent meals, like eat six times a day, but little meals, smaller meals, so you don't get so full and not a big uh, full meal. So, and not, last but not least, when to call your doctor, when to call your healthcare provider. Um, and basically, I'm going to talk about the symptoms of what we call COPD exacerbation or flare up. Um, so these are the things when they happen, you want to start calling your doctor. I used to say to people, if it crosses your mind, should I call my doctor? You should call them. If that, you know, and if it's, if it's not a big deal and they say, well, let's see, we'll wait a couple of days and see what happens. That's okay. Um, better call earlier than um, get into trouble. Because again, your defense mechanisms don't work as well. Um, it doesn't really maybe take a lot for some of some of you to tip you over the edge. So if you have increased shortness of breath from your baseline. And so what I mean by that, you know, daily, you know, living, you always get short of breath, let's say when you walk up the stairs or you make the bed or things like that. Now you find you're getting short of breath walking around the house or, um, you know, uh, walking to the bathroom. That that's that's an issue. A new or increased cough. So if you um, generally cough a lot, this is you coughing more, or it's a new cough. And it, even though people don't like to do this, you you need to if you do make mucus, if you do make sputum, that's what we call the mucus that comes out of your lungs. You need to to monitor the color of it. Um, it should be clear or white. Um, so yellow, green, brown, certainly red is anything to call, you know, a change in the color means that it can be an infection and certainly a change in the, in the amount. Increased use of your rescue or your symptom in, uh, inhaler. 
So you have your albuterol and maybe a regular week you use it maybe a couple times a week. Um, you know, when you go grocery shopping or something. Now, all of a you know, sudden you're using it, you know, 2, 3 times a day because you're more short of breath. That's a real, um, uh, idea for you. That's a real trigger that you that something's going on. You need to call your doctor. The other thing is nighttime symptoms and, um. You really, if you have any of what these call these nighttime symptoms, that's when to call your doctor too. Uh, if you're waking up at night with trouble breathing, um, if you're unable to lay down, I mean, and you can do that now, but you know, uh, you're waking up, you can't catch your breath, you you can't lay down. These are these are real um, um, tri these are real like I don't want to say alarms, but this is something you should call your doctor about. A good two thirds of these. Flare ups are associated with respiratory tract infections. So many times you'll need an antibiotic depending on, you know, the phlegm and the color and things like that. And you, and sometimes oral steroids or prednisone to settle things down. And the, the thing is, is the longer you wait, the more trouble you can get into. But if we talk about this is a, this is, so you get a, an infection, bacteria gets in there, viruses get in there. You have this whole inflammatory, this inflammation again. The more inflammation you have, the more inflammation you make because the inflammation makes, you know, and you get it again in this vicious circle. So the longer you wait, the harder it is to reverse it and the longer it's going to take to treat it. So when you start to have these symptoms, you don't have to have all of them, you know, any of these symptoms, then um, that's a, a trigger for you to call your doctor. So that's all the slides I have. I want to open it up for questions. Okay. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation, Sue. And uh, we do have a couple questions here. So the first one I'm seeing is how quickly do you usually move through the stages of COPD? It's quite variable. It's not like um, it's not like other diseases where you can predict. Um, you can have long plateaus where you stay the same, especially this is given that you're not smoking. Um, you can have long plateaus and then maybe you have a um, COPD flare up or pneumonia and that may your, your function may drop a little bit and then you may have another really long plateau. So it's quite variable from person to person. And, you know, I've taken care of people, you know, 10, 15 years, they're really just you know, they're doing everything right and they're taking their medicine. They really are staying at a plateau. Um, if you, again, if you continue to smoke or you are in an environment where you're continuing to have that trigger, then you're going to move through it pretty quickly. But sometimes okay. you have a little bit of a drop. You'll have a drop if you get if you have some sickness. Great. That makes a lot of sense, Sue. Thanks. This next one is, does secondhand smoke affect this? My parents smoked. Um, theoretically, it can. Um, if you look at the numbers, it doesn't, um, we don't have, you don't see a lot of people with secondhand smoke exposure, um, you know, have, um, the severity of the COPD that smokers do. And also I'm, uh, if, if you were exposed during childhood, but you're not exposed now, I think that you're pretty safe. If you have COPD and you're living in a home where you have smoke exposure, I think that that's a problem because again, you're already inflamed and kind of like, you know, your airways are kind of twitchy and inflamed. It doesn't take much to, to, make them worse. So um, you want to stay away from that kind of second, you know, secondhand smoke. But yeah, it's not good for anybody. I haven't seen a lot of people that never smoked or didn't have any kind of industrial exposure, just secondhand exposure, have a lot of COPD. But good okay. to stay away. Yeah. All of our parents smoked when we grew up. So, <laughs> or most of them, you know, that was very prevalent in the, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s. This next question is, are the spacers better for folks that have more advanced COPD? 
it doesn't matter. Uh, it's more of a device to help you get the inhaler in correctly in in correctly. Um, so, you know, kids use the spacers a lot because it's hard for them to, to coordinate. Um, maybe somebody who has a lot of arthritis in their hands, the spacer might be better. It doesn't, um, it really isn't, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't matter what type of COPD. It's more of a device to help get the inhaler in. Aha, uh -huh. that makes a lot of sense. We have excellent presentation. And then this last thing's a comment. It says, purse lip breathing seems like it could be helpful with calming anxiety when you can't catch your breath. Right, yeah, yes. And again, um, you know, I want to put that anxiety in the right context because some people are like, well, I'm just anxious. You're not just saying if you if you can't if you're having trouble breathing. Again, we're hardwired in our brains to be anxious about that it's a survival mechanism. So, the more short of breath you are, the more anxious you're going to be. The more anxious you are, the more short of breath. Um, but it really starts, you know, with the shortness of breath. Um, so don't let people say to you, well, just calm down and you'll be fine. It, it, it isn't, but that purse lip breathing, it really does um, help if you to get to get control. Um, because again, that you just kind of spiral down with the anxiety and the shortness of breath, because you, you know, you can't, can't catch your breath. But I would practice it a bit um, when you're not short of breath, because again, it's going to take when you get into that situation, it's going to take you a little bit to, you know, it's <laughs> my, it's like Lamaze breathing, you know, <laughs> you have to really focus on it um, through the shortness of breath. So practice it while you're, you know, feeling okay. I think that's good advice. And I've never known anyone to calm down after being told to calm down. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, we'll give it a second here to see if anything else comes through. And while we're doing that, Sue, is there anything else you want to tell us about um, caring for someone with COPD or living it with ourselves? I think a couple, I just thought of a couple things um, when we talked about going through the stages. Again, you know, COPD is a chronic disease, so you have to treat it chronically. Um, it's, that's why I think the self-care is so important. Um, it's it's kind of you know an every everyday treatment. Um, the other thing I I didn't mention in here is oxygen. Um, not everyone, in fact, probably a very a smaller percentage of people that I took care of with COPD needed oxygen. So it's not inevitable if you have COPD and even severe COPD that you will need oxygen. That will be something that needs to be checked periodically. Um, and at some, you know, at some point, if your lungs can't do their job, which their job is to get the oxygen to all the rest of the organs in the body, then you may need supplemental oxygen. Oxygen in itself, in this case, um, unfortunately, does not take care of the shortness of breath because, you know, again, the shortness of breath is more of the mechanical problems within the lungs from the COPD. Putting oxygen on, I mean, sometimes helps with it, but you know, it's not, if you think you come in and say, I'm sure sort of breath, I, I, I want some oxygen. It may not help the shortness of breath. What it does help though, is getting oxygen if to, to your brain and your kidneys and your heart and everything else that needs oxygen. If your oxygen levels are below 90, if they're above 90%, put, giving you supplemental oxygen doesn't help. So that's something that needs to be watched. Um, but again, um, Really, the majority of our patients with COPD did not uh, end up on oxygen. Um, so, you, you know, that's just something long term uh, to watch. Um, one other thing I was thinking about looking at the weather. Um, you, had, you know, we try to tell you to, you know, want you to walk, get outside. It's beautiful the last couple of days. But you want to avoid extremes in temperature. So very hot and humid weather. That's not the day to go out and uh, go, you know, weed your garden. And when it's cold, that cold air hitting your airways um, can cause the airways to tighten up and shortness of breath. So if it's cold, 
you should have something, a scarf or something over your, your mouth and your nose um, so that the air is a little warmer. Or stay home when it's real cold. So those were the couple things I thought of. Yeah. Yeah, those were really important. So thank you for sharing those with us. And we had a question come through as um, is an acapella device or lung flute helpful with people or helpful for people with COPD? It can be, um, especially on um, people with COPD that have trouble um, with mucus. Um, because what those devices are, the acapella or the lung flute is you're breathing out again, you know, they're tubes and you're breathing out against some resistance and then it vibrates a little bit. Um, so you get this little bit of vibration in your airways. So it can help, um, especially people who have trouble uh, with a lot of um, sputum and have trouble getting the sputum up. The acapella and the um, lung flutes can help. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Sorry. That, um, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for describing that. We'll just give it another second here to see if anything else comes through. Otherwise, Sue, thank you so much. Oh, oh you're I'm very welcome. Thank you. I'm saying thank you for this great presentation. I hope to stay in the mild stage for as long as I can. Yes, and there's no reason you can't. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're, oh, oh <laughs> the person, um, we, we are recording it. They missed your answer to the acapella device. But we'll share the recording with them. She's, the delivery man came. Please share video. Totally have you covered. I'll, I'll let you know when it's posted. Yeah. And the acapella devices um, are usually uh, you can get a script for them, and the like uh, respiratory companies uh, usually carry them. Some of the drugstores do, but yeah, that's really good to know. Thank you, Sue. All right, You're everyone. Welcome. Um, people, thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Thank you.